This is a message of thanks and gratitude to all you amazing Reluctant Preppers who are making Reluctant Preppers possible by supporting our mission on Patreon. With your help, we're overcoming a 75% drop in YouTube earnings because you're not standing still but are doing something about it and taking action by going to patreon.com slash reluctant preppers and pledging to keep us on the air. Now our team is 42 patrons strong and growing, and when we reach 100 patrons, we'll start sending out tokens of gratitude as a handwritten note from your host, Dunnigan Kaiser, and an autograph signed on a U.S. Silver Eagle to one of our patrons selected at random each and every month. If you haven't yet taken the step of joining in to support Reluctant Preppers, it's so easy. Just go to patreon.com slash reluctant preppers and pledge any amount you can. You guys are awesome, and we can do this together with your help at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. Did you know you can buy silver at spot price? Get your 10-ounce bar of silver at spot price today. Go to sdbullion.com slash rp. Not only will you be buying silver without any premium, you'll also be supporting the independent media. Reluctant Preppers gets a small commission when you take advantage of this special offer, going to sdbullion.com slash rp. That's sdbullion.com slash rp. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's been a long time since we've had a talk with this guest. We met him at the first Liberty Mastermind Symposium in Dallas, Texas in person. He is the founder of SilverShieldExchange.com. He is Chris Duane. He's been a longtime advocate of sound money in the face of fiat slavery. Chris, thank you for joining us again on Reluctant Preppers. Hey, thanks so much. I'm glad to get to speak to you again. I was hoping you could kick us off with, uh, if not a pep talk, at least a reality check-in for those who have been well-educated about the the true risks and the inherent um, peril of our debt-based fiat system and the abuses that it has perpetrated on people who have been earners and savers, uh, and in contrast to that, what they've tried to do to protect themselves from that in terms of accumulating real assets such as precious metals has seemed for many now to be uh, a move that has led them on an, on a cul-de-sac while the rest of the world moves them by, and they're seeing their fortunes not uh, visibly grow while other things are booming. Can you talk to us about, uh, first of all, what are the dynamics that we're seeing there and what are some of the things that, you know, corroborate that in your experience and and what does it really mean? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I guess we got to get to the point where um, people, when they wake up to this stuff, uh, tend to think like, oh my God, how doesn't everybody know this? And then when you do know that our system is built off of debt and we have false flags and you know, the entire political system is rigged and there's no money in the banks and that the banks are privately owned and all the governments in the world owe money to these. Like you start the head spin and you're like, this is going to end tomorrow. And I mean, when I first found out about all this in 2005, I mean, I, I mean, I was trying to wake up everybody, talk to my friends and family. I'm depressing the crap out of them. And, you know, Christmas parties talking about 9-11 and, you know, the Federal Reserve is privately owned and, you know, all of our money is actually debt and we paid off the debt. We'd still owe all the interest to the bankers. And, you know, you start talking about silver and, and all this other stuff. And, and then you realize that most people don't want to know about this. This is very uncomfortable truth to them, uh, mainly because they have no fit, clear path of getting out. Like they're stuck in it. So they, they kind of put it in the back of their mind. You know, they, they, I had one lady when I told her about all the things on 9-11, she goes, I don't want to know because that would mean that my government is evil. And like literally told me that. I'm like, OK, I get it. It's too scary for you. I'm going to move on. Um, and then for the people who do wake up and say, hey, Chris, this is all legit. This You can't run debt forever. You can't have this system work forever. When does this end? And that's the big thing. Like, Chris, when does this happen? And they always want the prediction of a date of some cataclysmic period where they get to do the aha to all their friends and that they're ready and all the other people aren't. And I tell people that's not the way to go about doing this. To me, you're doing this because this is the right moral thing to do. This is what in, uh, real to me, what real men do for their families. I mean, when I look into the future of what this country is going to look like, 
during a collapse and after a collapse, it's really scary. I just did a whole video talking about how this techno, uh, technocratic beer, you know, all these oligarchs, um, they're going to have AI, uh, you know, computers, robotics, where they're literally going to threaten half of the jobs in 10 years. Like half of human labor in the United States, forget about the rest of the undeveloped world, in the United States will be competing against robots that are owned by oligarchs that don't care about us. Uh, that's a very scary future. If you're a father, if you're, you know, you have young kids like I do, you know, you don't want to leave them out there. So to get back to the point of, Chris, when does this happen? Um, that's when there, I just did another video called, um, you know, going through the cycles of history and every 80 years, all of uh, America changes. And I, I point to the facts of the Kondratiev uh, economic cycle, who was a Russian economist back during Stalin that noticed that there was a, you know, essentially an 80 year cycle of growth, uh, you know, a spring, a summer, a fall and a winter of every economy. And it keeps revolving. You know, they, it grows and collapses, grows and collapses over these 80 years or four generations. And the most popular and influential book that I read was The Fourth Turning. And they point out, uh, Neil Strauss points out, that every 80 years in America, we go through a cataclysmic change. So 80 years before this, we had the Great Depression and World War II. And 80 years before that, we had the Civil War. And 80 years before that, we had the Revolutionary War. And every 80 years, it really changes the face of what America was. Because from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War, it was – uh, you know, states had the power. All the power was in the states. And then after the Civil War, the federal government came in and said, no states, you don't. And we own you. And we're going to burn and commit genocide in the whole South just to hold that federal government power to bear. And then in the 80 years after the Civil War, we had this centralization of power into New York and Washington, and it destroyed the local economies. And that's why we had the Great Depression as long as it was. And it was only saved by us bombing the rest of the economic competitors on the map in Asia and Europe in World War II, and that we came out of that with all the industrial base, uh, a landscape that wasn't uh, ravaged by war. And of course, we're going to have all this prosperity. Now we got these baby boomers, and now we have this global generational debt that is not only the United States, the entire world. So, you know, what is America going to look like after this? I don't know, but I can tell you what I do not want to have my wealth tied into anything that has counterparty risk, that is uh, fiat, that is, uh, you know, on a digit on a screen. I need real tangible wealth. And to me, that's calories, that's uh, ounces, that's uh, friends, tools, guns, you know, all the stuff that we've been prepping about. And it's not a matter of when it's going to happen it, or if it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And uh, if, so if we go by this 80-year cycle and uh, we use the, the model of that, the winter of our uh, economy started in the financial crisis of 2008, and it takes about 16 years. And I use the, the example from the beginning of the Great Depression to the end of World War II. It took 16 years to get through that winter cycle of the last time the United States went through this. And that will take us from now until 2024 before this is over. And I told people in this video – you know, we've been going on nine years since the financial crisis. So we got all these people waking up for nine years, essentially going, hey, you know, this isn't right. Uh, and all the bad debts, all the bad actors, all the bad things that happened in 2008, nobody went to jail. There was no systemic reform. And all the bad debts got sucked up to the sovereign global nation level, it went from an institutional problem with a couple bad banks into this global sovereign debt nation. And it's, it's everywhere. So I think it's going to take another seven years. So I don't know if people are going to be happy or bad about seeing this, but it's going to take another seven years for this to totally wash out of the system. And I don't know even if after this happens uh, that we're going to be on a good side of it because, like I mentioned before, these billionaires, these guys that own and control this paradigm are now going to be armed with AI, robotics, uh, you know, and all this surveillance power. Like I don't even know when we come out of this. I don't know what kind of world we're going to have, but I do know – I'm not going to be like these poor people in Venezuela who are losing 20 pounds a year. That's what the average Venezuelan lost, starving while their country goes through a hyperinflation. So, you know, for the people that are whining and complaining and feeling down about themselves because they prepped, uh, they need to readjust how they're thinking. Be fortunate that we still have time to prep. 
and we still have time to make uh, these adjustments and 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 be be aware and prepared for that time being. What specific examples do you see of evidence that there is such a low ebb of sentiment in in the uh, precious metals community, um, et cetera, demand that, that all those things we were talking about uh, before we started the recording? Yeah, I mean the the most blaring, glaring example is the U.S. Mint Silver Eagle sales. So. Um, since the financial crisis, Silver Eagle sales have risen from a half a million ounces a month to, on high, six million, but on average, four million ounces of Silver Eagle sales per month since the financial crisis eight years ago. And I've been doing this chart over the last six months. The average uh, Silver Eagle sales have dropped so considerably that even this past week, uh, I think it was 19 days into this month, the U.S. Mint only sold 235,000 Silver Eagles, which is down close to 95% from the four, you know nine-year average, average month, not the good months or the bad months, average month uh, in the middle of summer. So sentiment is totally trashed on silver because people are going, hey, this stinks. And they're looking at these cryptocurrencies at the exact same time going up thousands of percent, hundreds of percent money out of thin air. You know, everybody's talking about it, and that's a thing. And I tell, tell people, I said, the cryptocurrency thing is nothing more than a digital illusion of wealth. It's another crypto Ponzi scheme. It's another thing that the banksters want us to play along with. I said, it's no different than the silver ETF. When that came out, that took real demand away from the real physical silver, which is the real threat to their system. When you have real tangible wealth in the hands of individuals, that's a threat to their fiat generational debt-based Ponzi schemes. And right now, the cryptos are riding high, but at the end of the day, they're a Ponzi scheme. They're only worth what somebody's willing to pay. And right now, you got a lot of greater fools out there throwing a lot of money into stuff that they don't fully understand. And the biggest problem that nobody's talking about in the crypto market is that when the time comes, when the government wants to roll out their cryptocurrency, they're going to use anti-money laundering uh, laws to crush the cryptos and for people to go, oh, they can't, it's decentralized, it's on the internet, baloney. It's the exact same laws that they use to break the Swiss banking system, which is the most secretive, most powerful banking system in the world. The, the U.S. government used anti-money money laundering laws, the AML laws, to expose and, and break everybody in, involved in that. And now, uh, you know, I've got uh, examples of the FBI breaking, um, you know, BTCE, which is an exchange in Greece where they arrested one Russian guy who's invest, uh, who exchanged $4 billion worth of Bitcoin over the last couple of years. Uh, there's a neurologist in, in uh, uh, Peter Steinmetz in, in Arizona that was arrested for selling Bitcoin to an FBI agent as an unlicensed uh, uh you know, money exchange broker or something like that. I mean, this is a neurologist. Like, he had a pretty good life before Bitcoin and went into this thing, and now his life is destroyed. I don't know how much money or jail time he's going to be facing. But for these anti-money laundering laws, simply owning Bitcoin right now, and the FBI has basically an office set up in Coinbase, which is the largest uh, Bitcoin exchange out there. So, you know, all this hype and, and, and drama that's going into cryptos, you know, if you didn't get involved in it, to me, Good for you. If you did get involved with it, I would sell. Make sure you pay your taxes and get out as soon as possible because you do not want to be exposing yourself to anti-money laundering laws because they associate that with terrorist financing, ironically. Uh, and you could face not only losing your Bitcoin, uh, but you also have uh, now facing criminal and civil asset forfeiture. They're talking about using civil asset forfeiture because you're involved with cryptocurrencies, there's a law going through the Senate right now where they're going to apply civil asset forfeiture, which means you could literally lose everything you own besides the crypto. Um, I think the risk involved being simply involved in crypto is way bad, you know, the way worse than any potential rise that you could get out of it. And another reason why I love silver, it's you want decentralized, silver is the most decentralized. You want private, silver is the most private. Once you get it in your possession, uh, I mean, you could be buried for generations. It's the, to me, it's the best use of uh, of uh, you know getting your money out of the system. When people talk about you know the fact that that silver has languished under and and people like we had Bill Murphy from Gata on uh, just recently, we've had him on many times on the channel talking about the smoking gun evidence and proof of not only collusion and illegal suppression by major bullion banks who some of whom actually have paid 
huge, you know, multi-billion dollar fines for the manipulations that they've done to try to uh, and successfully uh, keep precious metal prices uh, suppressed to divert public interest from them and so on. But when people talk about how long can this continue, you were mentioning uh, even some longtime advocates, of, you know, critics Paul of... Paul Craig Roberts. Of, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Craig Roberts. He, I heard on another interview, he said the Fed can keep this going on forever. Um, so even guys, you know, like uh, Murphy and Gata and stuff like that, I kind of feel bad for them because I really feel like they feel they're like hopeless optimists. I mean, I know it's a negative bet against the economy, but they're hoping that somebody at the SEC, that some judge, that some court, that there's going to be some justice inside the system, and they're never going to get it. It's a completely rigged system. The only thing that they do is keep you thinking that you're involved in the system, so you keep working inside the system. To me, I don't care. Justice will never be brought until the markets collapse. Justice will never be brought until there's a physical default in the markets. Uh, that's when justice will happen for these guys. So anybody thinking that they can, you know, uh, sue, uh, you know, expose, uh, you know, convince some politician, never, ever going to happen. Hope is control. And that's what I feel uh, a lot of these guys have wasted their entire careers. And I can't even say wasted. I mean, they, they help wake up other individuals to take action. And I think that's where the answer is. It's for every individual in themselves saying, hey, do I want to be a part of this debt and death paradigm? Do I want to uh, prepare for what must come? Uh, do I want to be, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's enabling the worst in humanity? I mean, Trump has got six Goldman Sachs, well, now five because Bannon's gone, six Goldman Sachs guys that are working for him. And this is the guy that was making fun of Ted Cruz because his wife was Goldman Sachs and had loans to it. The system is completely rigged. It's bought and paid for. And the only way out is for you to prepare for yourself. Realize that the world's messed up, but your world doesn't have to be. Along the way, if people realize that you know, somewhere deep inside them, whether you call it their conscience or their intuition or their gut or their reason, uh, unclouded by the smokescreen that uh, we're faced with all the time, all this propaganda misdirection, the the, the Dow and Jones, Dow Jones propaganda average, as Andy Hoffman likes to call it, um, for people who have really see through that, but still want to uh, live a life of abundance and uh, enjoy the time that they do have here while they're taking responsible steps to protect uh, their family from catastrophic loss in the future. Where's Is there some kind of a, I don't want to call it a compromise, but is there a way to do both? Yeah. I mean, I'm a perfect example. I mean, I, I'm probably the most hardcore stacker I know. Uh, you know, I got my million ounce or million calories of, uh, of uh, storable food. I got guns. I got, you know, I was in the Marines for seven years. I'm working out. I that's another thing. I mean, people really need to physically get in shape. I mean, I just recently, I lost 15 pounds. I've got my bench press back up to 325. Uh, like I've been working out because it's going to be a physically taxing, uh, you know, trial when it happens. But yeah, there, there's a balance to be made. I think a, 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 uh, a man who is, you know, living to his highest and best self takes, uh, you know, takes the precautions but lives a normal life. I mean, I know plenty of doctors and, you know, members of my group that, you know, live you know, very successful in this paradigm doing what they do. But what they what they do in their private lives uh, of prepping and stuff like that, you know, they do that because, uh, you know, quietly because, the, you know, you really don't want to draw attention to yourself. Um, but they do that for their friends, their family and knowing that bad times are going to come and that just because, uh, people are incapable or ignorant of it doesn't mean that they should suffer from it, especially when you are aware and prepared. Um, so, well, I mean, I, I'm happy the price of silver is down because I can buy more ounces. I'm happy the lights are still on. I can still take my family to go do, you know, eat dinner outside and go see movies and do all the fun things that, you know, kids need to see and do. Um, so, you know, I live a very normal life outside of me being this, you know, real radical guy on YouTube and, you know, designing debt and death silver and stuff like that. I'm a very normal guy that enjoys what we have, but I'm doing it kind of almost like reminiscent, like this isn't going to last forever. So, you know, and my kids aren't going to be this age forever and, you know, I'm enjoying it while it's going on, but also not buying into it and saying, Hey, this is going to go on forever and I'm going to go you know, go get fancy cars and, you know, make all these ridiculous trips that I don't need be at the expense of, you know, stacking more silver or buying more, you know, things that you actually need. So, yeah, we, that's one of the things that, that you just made me remember from some of the guests that we've had on when they talk about borrowing 
our current lifestyle from their future, from our children, from our grandchildren, and that now we've borrowed so far, we borrowed into oblivion, basically. And what I hear you saying is, uh, rather than just falling into that trance and that pit of just sort of self-gratification, you can still find a responsible balance point of making serious uh, diligent, prudent precautions and preparations, and at the same time, um, finding ways to uh, in, enjoy some uh, some innocent fruits of of you know uh, of natural pleasures in, in the world with your family uh, and time together and making friendships. And I guess if you could touch on that too, you talked about in the past networks of friendship. What's what's so important about the strength of true friends? Well, I mean, uh, just to get back to the the. Um you know, the, the instant gratification now and delayed gratification of prepping. Um, to me, it doesn't even take that much, okay? And it's the reason, at least for me, silver is so undervalued. I believe that silver, uh, it, it, throughout all of human history and two-thirds of the world today that lives off of $2 a day, one-tenth of an ounce of silver represents one day's worth of hard human labor. I mean, there's stories in the Bible talking about, you know, field workers working for a denarius, which is a tenth of an ounce of silver. Roman soldiers were paid for a tenth of an ounce of silver. Uh, in the Sun Tzu, The Art of War, you could buy a 100,000-man army, including weapons, uh, chariots, and food. A uh, 100,000-man army for 1,000 ounces a day, which is less than a tenth of an ounce of silver. Um, so when you delay gratification and buy an ounce of silver, to me, that's buying 10 days worth of hard human labor in the future uh, when the, the paradigm resets. Uh, I just read that there was 3.4 billion acres of arable land in the, in the world today, and yet there's only about a billion ounces of silver above ground, which means that you would technically be able to buy three acres of land for an ounce of silver. I mean, that's what the ratio would be. Uh, and for people who say that's ridiculous, the Louisiana Purchase, one ounce of silver bought 45 acres of land during that. You know, I mean, it's a totally different period in history, but it's not without precedent. Um, so to me, every ounce of silver you buy is like a nuclear bomb of prepping um, that far exceeds what you would be able to do with anything else. So I don't think people need to sacrifice too much. Um, but I definitely think that the average person should have at least a thousand ounces of silver as a first step goal. Uh, to prepping. And then anything after that is starting to become abundant. And the abundance thing goes into now, uh, you know, what friends and people you have around you, what skills you have. Uh, you know, if you find yourself surrounded by people who are, uh, you know, reveling in the debt and death paradigm, you know, I used to live in New York and New Jersey, and there would be people, you know, and work in Wall Street and, and the car business and uh, I don't know any other business out there that would just thrive off of making a killing and you know, all these kind of war mentalities that they have for the business, uh, you don't want to be around those people when this all happens. Um, but you do want to spend time with your friends and family because that's what really what will hold, uh, you know, and what you're working for. Because if you if you don't have something, uh, you know, people involved in your life, uh, it's going to be a very lonely existence. I've never really gotten into the whole, you know, move to Montana, go you know, buy a log cabin and, and then, you know, polish your gun until the apocalypse comes. That, that to me is not something I ever want to do. I want to be surrounded by good, abundant people um, and, and create and be a solution to a community that will, I know, grow uh, with the capital that we have saved from the silver. If we could uh, have you tell us a little bit more about your Silver Shield Exchange. What is the mission of what you're doing there and what are some of the ins and outs of that that people might not be aware of? Yeah, it's silvershieldexchange.com. Um, and basically what I've been doing was I was a hardcore silver stacker back in, I don't know, 2005. I used to buy 100-ounce bars and uh, you know, I, and then eventually went to Silver Eagles. And then I realized, man, this is not fun. Uh, the silver ba the bars never gained in premium. And the Silver Eagles, you know, it was kind of boring to have all these same design every, every time. Um, and it was literally tied to the manipulated price of silver. Uh, so since 2012, I've been designing and coining my own silver strikes. And uh, I think I've done over 130 different designs and 500 different strikes. Um, and recently, I've been doing the Silver Shield Mini Mintage. So every week, I come out with a new design that's only made for that week. And they sell it for 2 to $3 over spot, depending on the quantity that you have, which is comparable to what you would pay for 
uh, a U.S. Mint Silver Eagle Canadian Maple Leaf and a little bit more expensive than generic bullion. But the real value is that they go up tremendously in value. I just did a study that of the last 24 weeks that we've been doing this, the average secondary market premium on these are $15 over spot, which is almost twice the value of the ounces that are on there. Uh, so now I've created, and these designs, are, I believe, are historically significant. I mean, we're calling out uh, you know, the, the politicians, the bankers, the war machine, uh, you know, and then positive things like civil disobedience and, and all these type things. Um, and they're going up, you know, on average, about $15 over spot. So you buy it for 2 to $3 over spot, and on average, they're doing $15 over spot. So now I've created silver that is really breaking free of the manipulated price of silver because they have collector's value on them. Um, so to me, it's just a tremendous value, and anybody who's stacking silver really should take a look at it because you're never going to get more bang for your buck than at, the, you know, the Silver Shield mini mintages. And to me, that's my, mis- my mission because I'm a firm believer that you should be consistently stacking on a weekly basis, sacrificing whenever you can to get these ounces. Um, number one, because you got to have ounces in your, in your prepping. But these also go up in fiat value in the meantime. Right? A lot of people will end up buying them and flipping them and buying two coins the next time because they made you know, an extra you know, an ounce worth of silver or fiat uh, selling them. So... To me, it's just a really beneficial program, one that makes stacking exciting again uh, and is providing real tangible wealth with, to me, historical value that I think after the paradigm collapses, I just gave the example. I mean, can you imagine if there was some crazy Russian that was making silver coins that during the Soviet empire that mocked Stalin, that mocked Lenin, that predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union? Like those would be legendary now, like risking you know, government, you know, being sent to the gulag. And that's kind of what I'm doing with the United States government. Like this is an immoral military industrial complex owned by Goldman Sachs. You know, the corporations are totally uh, running rampant, not paying their taxes and stuff like that. And the United States is suffering. And here I am predicting. I mean, one of the best selling series I have is called the Death of the Dollar series. Um, To me, I think after this collapse happens, these designs, while they're doing very well now, will be absolutely legendary after the fact. Like, you know, I, I, I'm really excited about that. So I've been continuing to do this and five years into it, and we found a tremendous amount of success. Well, Chris, if uh, people want to find out uh, the most they can about your work, as well as some of your uh, educational information that you've offered, uh, where can they find you? Uh, probably the best place to start is The Greatest Truth Never Told on YouTube. I think we've had 28 million views since we started it in 2011, 138,000 subscribers. That's kind of like where I do videos on a you know, weekly or daily basis there. And then if you're interested in the uh, silver strikes that I do, I do proof and BU strikes. Uh, you can go to silvershieldexchange.com with an X, uh, and you can go take a look at them there. Well, Chris Dwayne, founder of The Greatest Truth Never Told on YouTube and silvershieldexchange.com, just thank you very much for joining us once again on Reluctant Preppers and for yeah, giving us a reality check on why we do what we do and uh, and how to balance that out uh, so that we don't people don't end up feeling that life is passing them by but they're really taking the prudent steps that they uh, ought to to provide and protect for their family so thanks Chris for being here once again uh, with us on Reluctant Preppers absolutely thank you so much